Hey, welcome to a video about the cake and the candles problem, which I discussed on number file recently. Uh, this is a video about how I built the GeoGebra files that I used in that video. And uh, I should explain the problem just as a heads up. Uh, you should probably watch the number file video to get the full context though. But the problem is very simple. You put two candles on a cake at random, whatever that means. And then you cut the cake somewhere at random. Uh, what are the chances you get a candle on each piece of cake? The exact definitions of all the terms in that are important uh, and subject to interpretation and that changes how the problem pans out as we talk about in the number four video and indeed in this video. Um, but go and watch that first if uh, if you haven't watched it already otherwise this will make much less sense. I won't spend ages on the actual problem this is going to be about how I built the thing. It's been a long time since I made a video on this channel sorry about that I had to move house and look after uh, my young son. Uh, all good though I'm in a new house that's nice. Uh, but this is a long video, maybe not because it's been a long break, but also there's lots to talk about. So I've done three different things in the video. I um, and you feel free to skip to the bit that makes you interested. So uh, over there, there's a, a little uh, visualization of the problem, which I did first in the number five video. So that's making the problem turn into a little 3D space. Talk about how I build that one there. Uh, up there in the corner, I pres presume it's up there. I've left it up there. Is uh, a little file that. I when I start simulating the problem in a Monte Carlo method, you can do that in Jodhpur as well. And I did that with a square cake of, or on a, a long line cake first, and then I did it on a square cake. And then up there, uh, where it starts looking prettier, is when we move into a, a circle version. And there's all sorts of complications with that, and you get some pretty images. But that's where it also ties in with a video that Grant Sanderson made with Brady on the Number File channel about Bertrand's paradox and the way of choosing a chord in a circle being more difficult to define than maybe we thought it was at first. And, and that sort of came home to roost in this problem. So it was nice to have a context for Grant's somewhat abstract discussion with Brady turned up for real in my interpretation of this probability question. So feel free to skip to the bit that takes your uh, your fancy and I'll put links in the description uh, to those sections. Uh, but hey, you can fast forward if you know how to do that if you want to. And in the meantime, enjoy the video. Right, so here is the file that I first used in that number file video. We're just kind of demonstrating how the problem works and visualizing one way of solving it. And that was the way with using a sort of volume of a tetrahedron. Is it a tetrahedron? I think it is a tetrahedron. Yeah, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, uh, and this file, which has the three coordinates here, the candle coordinate, the candle two coordinate, and the cut line. And it moves things around on the right-hand side based on where you move these points. You can also see the regions where we are in between. So that's the region where we've got in between, and that's not, and that little pop-up turns up. So there's a few things to point out here. How did I make uh, a, a split view? So we've got a a flat graphics window here and a three-dimensional graphics window here uh, and how do you sort of animate things like showing that that is now a square based pyramid yes they were tetrahedrons these two shapes uh, but they're yeah they turn into a pentahedron a square based pyramid when you do that and that's the volume of the shape that's uh, it's nice to see so we're going to build this one first and then we'll talk maybe about how to do the simulation files after that so I said we're going to start on building the visualization of this problem with the split view and I've got a blank GeoGebra window here to start with. Before we do anything else let's set up the split screen style. We'll move it around later on I'm sure but at the moment you do actually have a split screen running on GeoGebra. The default window is an algebra view and a graphics view and it's worth saying you can always drag these around so I can drag the algebra view at the top. Sometimes you do that by accident it's kind of annoying you can drag it back to the side uh, and you can pop them out. So if I pop out this graphics view, now I've got a separated one. And that's really useful. When you upload a file, though, to GeoGebra resources, it just takes one of those views. I think um, we should try that later on. But I'm going to combine everything into the main view. So I'm going to pop this back in. And that's this little button here. And actually, what I want to do is have my two-dimensional graphics view as is, although I'll turn off the axes in, in time. And I also want to see a three-dimensional view. So I'm going to click on the view menu, click on 3D graphics, and I get a second window turning up here, which I can drag across. And obviously I can move around in the same way. If I wanted it to be up high, I can go up there. But actually side by side is probably what I do want here. And let's put it back down there and resize it with that. I'll tidy this up later on. Now let's have a think about what we need to build here. I chose to model the cake uh, as a sort of one-dimensional line. So I'm just going to zoom in on this i'm dragging the x-axis with the shift button held down there uh, and the shift button on the y-axis they're dragging because i just kind of want to get the k between zero and one uh, and let's 
let's just draw the cake, shall we? This doesn't matter how to do it. I'm just going to use the tools here. I'm going to go between 0.2, just because that's the first dot, uh, to one here. And then we're going to go down here. I'm just drawing the cake. So I've got a little visualization. Now I could do this by typing, but I've got kind of a snap to grid thing on here. So it is hitting those points accurately. And I probably what I'll do is I'll hide if I select everything here and just hide the uh, label. So I don't really care about those labels. Actually, quite often I, I prefer to at the moment it's building these objects in the algebra view in construction order. Quite useful to see what I last built, but quite often I want to see it in object type. So you can sort them by object type and then the points come and the segments come and that's easier to maybe show or hide all the points and that sort of thing. Uh, I realized I haven't done this symmetrical. So at least I, do, I can just drag these back and they are still snapping to a grid point. So that's my sort of nominal cake. Uh, and I want three points that exist on this cake, the candle, the first candle, the second candle, and the cut point. So let's just put, I'm going to grab the point tool and put them on the axis. If you click on the axis, oh, it makes a point. That was made a point at the origin. I wonder why it's snapping to grid so, so hard. Now let's talk about the snap to grid. If I press escape, just to get back to that and look on the graphics view, I've got these things, point capture style, automatic, force it to snap to grid. Um, Although it doesn't always snap to grid, it's only when you're close to the points. And then fixed grid means you can only click on the grid points, and off means it doesn't snap to a point. Now, I do kind of like the snapping. Let's leave it on automatic and see if I can get the behavior I want. I just want it to be on the x-axis. There we go. So that's a point. It's called itself E, and it drags around. Actually, what I might need to do is limit it to between 0 and 1. So let's. I'm going to delete E and think about that. I'm going to create a segment between 0 and 1. And those have snapped points. And that segment is called J. There it is. And if I make a point on that segment, I can do that by clicking on it, by the way. Uh, let's have a look at what, what is G. G is a point on J. And you can see that's the command I would use if I wanted to just type that in. So if I want to make another point on J, let's do point bracket J. And it's made it. And you, you put, it puts it at the start of it. There's another point. And let's also do that again. It's labeling them automatically. I'm going to rename all of these later on. So E and F, I don't really care about. In fact, the segment, I don't really care about. I'm not going to delete them. I'm just going to hide them. Uh, and the segment J, I'm going to hide as well. But now G, H, and I are limited to that region. So in the background, they're on a segment, which is limited. And that's one way of limiting the points. There are other ways too, but this is maybe the simplest way. Let's rename these. So G, I'm going to call the cut point. Uh, and that's actually the name of the point, not just its caption. Let's do candle one. And let's do candle two. And I think this is exactly what I did in the previously made file. So these move around, but they don't do anything. What I really want to do is reflect their regions. So the whole point of this visualization was that on the uh, the right hand side of the screen here in the 3D mode, I can see like a cube representing the possibility space of those three variables. Uh, so uh, what did I do? I think I said candle one being the X coordinate, candle two being the uh, y coordinate which in GeoGebra is sort of going back there um it's this axis here and z is the one vertically up in this representation also i don't want any of these objects to show up on the 3d view i want that to be separate so what i'm going to actually do is just select all of these with the right mouse drag and get all their properties and just in advance choose them to be only visible on graphics one not on the 3d graphics mode that's easy to do and they're, they're not visible over there so on the 3d mode uh, what i had was a cube and since each of these points is between zero and one, I need a cube uh, of side length one. Now I think I can, I wonder if I can do that automatically. Uh, there is a cube command and what it wants is three points or a square to build it off. Actually, I think we can get away with two points. Let's just try it. I'm going to do the origin zero, 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 three dimensional stuff, remember. And the point one comma zero comma zero. I'm just curious. Yeah, it does build it. I'm not quite sure how it's doing it, but you can see it's built the cube I need. Uh, and let's just roll with that. I don't want this to appear on the graphics one. So the same deal, the cube is now an object, object properties, turn off it on graphics there. And you can see it's made some other auxiliary points. Then what else is it made? The, did it make anything else? Uh, they might be in auxiliary objects. So the cube is turning off and on, but it's not, it's showing something else on the graphics one. And you can see if I hover over it, that's a quadrilateral, and that's not visible in my algebra display. That's because it's an auxiliary object. When you make a cube, uh, it's just made all the gubbins that help make the cube, so the faces are six different objects. Um, and maybe there'll be a better way just to define the, the points in the segments, but the cube command exists, so you can play with that. And if you do define a cube like that, you're going to have to deal with these auxiliary objects. You can turn them on and off with 
right clicking and turning auxiliary objects. So actually, I don't want any of them. So I'm going to delete all those quadrilaterals. Uh, and it does delete the cube. Maybe I don't want to do that. Undo. Uh, I'm just going to hide them then. That's one way around it. Now you could you could have built all of these things uh, from scratch, but I also don't want the segments here. So I'm just going to hide all of those segments which look like they've been made by the command. And H and G have also been made. Like, so let's just hide them. Uh, or do I want them? I, I Actually, I do want them, but I don't want them on graphics one. So let's select all the cube points, which is those six and turn them off on the graphics one so now they're only on graphics two but it hasn't put points on uh and i want the segments so i've just hidden the segments okay this is the sort of thing you battle with every time i do want the segments visible but i don't want them on graphics one or at least the ones that intersect with the plane the graphics one exists in so i'm just going to turn it off there and let's turn them back on visible and now looking better actually i don't really care about the names of the points so let's hide the names of those. And that's looking better. Now we've got a cube. In fact, maybe I don't want the points visible. I want the edges. That's my cube. Zooming in with the mouse wheel is good. Dragging around with the right mouse button changes the view and dragging with the left button also spins it. Dragging with the middle button moves it around. And that's a good way of uh, recentering your view. Although you can always center the view by clicking on the graphics view you want and typing center view. And let's center it on the center of the cube. Let me just get this right. I think that's the point, point 0.5, comma, point 0.5, comma, point 0.5. Yeah, that looks like it centered it. And if I right click drag, it spins around the center point. And that's a good way of not having to do it by hand. I also don't like in the 3D view, uh, the illusion of perspective being lost. So I'm going to turn on in the graphics view, then this drop down here, there's a, uh, a projection. So I'm going to turn on perspective mode. Here we go. And it looks slightly more like a real three dimensional thing just my preference. Uh, there is a nice 3D glasses mode. I think I talked about that before. I'm not going to get distracted by that today. Okay, there's my cube. What I now want to do is make points appear in the 3D view that correspond to these things. So let's just define them. Uh, let's say, uh, how do I do this? Like, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just make a new point, which is going to be the X coordinate of handle one and have a Y coordinate of zero and an X, a Z coordinate of zero. And that's appeared over there. It's called it M. I am going to check it doesn't appear on graphics one. I don't want it over there. And what other conditions? I want it to be labeled as candle one. I'm going to give it a caption and just show the caption on there. We can show the label. And now as I drag candle one around, you can see it moves on that axis there. So I want to do something similar for candle two and the cut point. Uh, let's, I'll let them, let it label itself as long as I can remember which is which, that's probably bad practice, but hey, we're going to roll with it. So let's do candle two, but this time I want zero X coordinate. I want it to be the X coordinate of candle two. Notice I'm using X brackets, the name of a point to grab the X coordinate out of it. And that's a really useful command. You can do something similar with Y and Z, but I want the Z, the what Z coordinate to be zero. And this now should move around as I drag candle two. There it is. Uh, let's rename N or rather give it a caption of candle two. And get it to show the caption. You can choose all, you can have the value there as well if you want to do. I'm just going to leave that off. And let's do something similar for the cut point, which I've chosen to go on the vertical 0, 0, 0,0, x of cut point. If I just put in cut point here, it would try and be, be putting a point inside the z coordinate of a point, and it doesn't like that. So I want the x coordinate to be grabbed out and put into the z coordinate. And we'll recaption that as cut point. There we go. Has that done it? So let's just check these three move around. There we go. Cut point moving up and down. Candle two moving on the y axis and that on the z axis. Now, actually, I can see them turning up here. I don't want them there. So let's just check that these three don't turn up on graphics one at all. And that's better. So I've now got the cut point moving around. The last thing I want a 3D thing, and the kind of the whole point is that the positions, these three coordinates or these three points, define one point in 3d space because there's just three parameters here so let's make that and I'm, I'm going to call this point i did this in the original file but um maybe that's not the best definition but i didn't know what else to call it so i'm just going to roll with that and it is going to have the coordinates of uh, x of candle one uh, x of candle two in the y coordinate and x of cut point in the z coordinate and now you can see, particularly if I let this spin around, you can see point is floating somewhere in space there. And as I move these around, it moves both point and the requisite coordinate. That's the cut point, and that's candle two. Okay. 
And that was the point, that was representing all the possible spaces of the candles and the cuts in three-dimensional space, and that's pleasing already. Uh, actually, it's really hard to see where they are unless this thing is spinning, but there's a useful spinning device tool in JoJo, but this button here will auto-spin it. You can just flick it with your mouse. I didn't have to do my big hand movement there, but you can just flick it as if you're sort of throwing it with your drag mouse. Or you can control it by clicking this on off, and then you have a speed control and a direction control here as well, which is pretty useful. So actually a, a mild rotation uh, is quite useful to keep the three-dimensional illusion alive, and you can see how things are moving. When I drag them, you see candle one changing there and the point changing with it. Because it's rotating, you keep the illusion of three dimensions alive. So that's our basic setup. Um, I think that's pretty much all we need to start with. The rest of it is maybe drawing the regions where one is in between the other uh, and then prettifying it. Uh, so let's move on to prettifying now. Okay, a little wish list of things to make this look a bit prettier. Uh, tidying up the graphics view on the left there. I don't need the grid. Um, maybe emphasizing the cut point needs a sort of vertical line because that's the line of the cut instead of just a point. A point isn't a cut. Uh, and drawing the shapes in the three-dimensional mode that let me see what the, the the successful regions are and the fact that they're a pyramid, actually. Uh, so one step at a time, let's do the easy things first. I'm just going to draw a vertical line, which uh, will emphasize the cut. I'll just get, uh, let's just use a line tool. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to type it. Uh, I want a perpendicular line. Perpendicular line going through the point cut point. Uh, perpendicular to the x-axis and writing x-axis with a capital A is the clue uh, really useful these three built-in lines to judge where x-axis y-axis z-axis all have this format and they're available without having to make a new line you could just make a new line which is on the x-axis and label that but whatever this works and I don't want that to have a label so let's turn the label off and let's make it a dotted line uh, did that work nope I, ooh. I changed the default thing, so let's click on X, then change it to dotted, yeah, and maybe, yeah, I have to turn the label off. Now when I drag that, it's showing a cut through it. That's showing up on the on the other graphics view. So you're, you're going to have to do a lot of faffing with the advanced ticking the right tab for where things to show up. I want that to be on the top-down view here, not on the 3D mode. It's looking all right now. Uh, I can turn the grid off here. I don't really need the grid there. And actually what I don't really care about is the Y-axis here. That was completely arbitrary. Uh, I've chosen to make it there. It doesn't really matter what my cape size is. So I actually want to turn the y-axis off, and that's useful to know how to do in the drop-down graphics. So I just right-clicked on the background here. You've got some basic options. You can choose the dimensions of the screen if you want to do it by hand, uh, the aspect ratio, and you can lock it so you can't change it anymore. But <coughs> crucially, you've got controls for the x-axis and the y-axis as well. And I'm just going to turn off the y-axis. In fact, the x-axis, um, the easy way to do here is I just, I just turned off the... Uh, negatives i just turned on positive direction only and you see i've just got that in there now it does carry on to the right which i don't care either but it was just an easy way to make that uh, not go off to the left there hey if i wanted to do this properly maybe i just turn off the x axis and draw a segment on uh, and that's the sort of center line it doesn't really matter um knock yourself out you have your own creative decisions to make and that's a good thing what else did i say we wanted to do here oh we want to draw some three-dimensional shapes i think don't we uh, and, and maybe get this uh, idea that when it is in the region, so the cut point between the candles, something changes to indicate that's a success for the, the problem. The original problem was, what are the chances you cut between the candles? Not between, between, not between. Uh, but if you move this, it also could end up going between. So we want some way of telling whether we've got between them. So let's do that first. I'm going to make a, a Boolean condition. Uh, it's just going to be true if the cut is between. So I'm going to call it cut between. Uh, and let's think about how to define that. I want the... Um, uh, an if statement is going to do this. Um, an if statement returns true or false. Well, I can tell it to return true or false. Let's try it. If the x of cut point is greater than... Tell you what. Let's do x of candle 1. less than x of cut point and i don't know if it's going to let me do a two-dimensional check here let's try it x of candle two uh, then return true and he needs a capital true capital t for true i think for george but let's just try that is that gonna like it it's done something it's telling me false at the moment let's see if it so if x of candle one is less than x of cut point and less than x of candle two true otherwise false the first argument is what happens when the condition is satisfied and then it's otherwise let's see what happens when i drag it it is working 
Now, if I wanted to, I could have used the keyword and, and there's a function uh, in GeoGebra. Oh, no, there isn't. Ah, oh, yes, that's right. You have to use the uh, the boolean commands, double and, double ampersand for an and, and a double line. I'm doing a shift backslash or front slash. Anyway, uh, that's for or. Uh, and there's a not command, which I think I use exclamation mark. Anyway, uh, easier to type the inequality there. Uh, so it proved. We'll maybe talk about Boolean values another day. Anyway, this changes between false and true to false. And I can use that to change things. So let's just do a simple thing. Let's have a piece of text appear. I'm going to make the text by clicking on the text tool and say, cut is between candles. Exclamation mark. We don't need that, but let's just, that's the piece of text. And I can drag that around, but in its properties, and this is a crucial thing for anything which hides or shows based on something is in advanced, you have a condition to show the object. And that condition is something that needs to be true, so it's a Boolean value when you want the object to be visible. In this case, it's just a value cut between, which I've made defined to be true whenever it's between and not. So that's it. And you see it's vanished because the cut is not between and hopefully it will appear when we drag it between. Bingo. And that's a way to make all sorts of things happen based on a Boolean. You can have an if statement which checks cut between and use that to control other things. But here's a simple way of making something appear and disappear. That's good. Uh, let's um, let's make the I think I made the point look a bit different when it's between. So let's change the properties of this point. Um, how should we do this? Should we make it change color? That's the easiest way to do it. Let's let's say uh, the point is fully blue. Now RGB values take a little bit of getting used to, but uh, it's an amount of red, an amount of green, an amount of blue to define any color in the, the spectrum. And GeoGebra does that with a value between 0 and 1 instead of one zero to 255, which is quite often maybe what you might be used to. Anyway, that's, uh, I've just said the, the color of this point is blue at the moment. You can see it's changed to blue over here. But what I can do, because there are formulas for those things, I can say that that depends. I could say like when, so if cut between happens, I the cut is between, then return the value 1, so make it fully red, otherwise 0. And I could make the blue turn off if cut between, then make that uh, zero, uh, otherwise one. And hopefully it would flip from red to blue. I think, let's find out. It's blue at the moment. And now it's red, blue, red, blue, red. Yeah, so that's a neat way of using the dynamic coloring thing is realizing that in the formulae of the properties for color, as long as you go to the advanced, you can put formulae in there particularly if they depend on Boolean values or a continuously changing thing, as long as you scale it then between zero and one. Now, if you don't like RGBV, you can do HSV or HSL. So hue, saturation and value or hue, saturation and luminance. I'll let you go and look up on Wikipedia about color spaces and how they're defined. It's very interesting for me as a colorblind person uh, to realize there's a lot there which is going to remain mysterious to me. Uh, but I do like the, the science of color uh, when it comes down to it. If you didn't investigate the Megapixel project that Matt Parker and Katie Steckles and I was involved with a few years ago, trying to make a full color uh, image by coloring by hand with only red, greens and blues, uh, literally doing what your computer screen or your phone screen does, then look up Megapixel. But that's again, something else to look up. So we've done some nice conditional coloring and conditional appearing. What else? We want to draw a pyramid, uh, our tetrahedron. So the, re the reason this is nice is that the three-dimensional cube is it's obvious when you're in between because you're in the region uh, when x of this point is bigger than that one. So what does that look like as a region? Let's build that next. So trying to plot these regions in 3D space can be tricky if you don't know the answer already. Now, you might have seen the answer already in the earlier file I showed, but if you, if you don't know what it is, this can be hard to visualize. So let's try and talk it through. The way I can visualize success here is if the cut point is between the candles and in the way I've coded it, that's if the cut point is bigger than candle one. I say cut point, I mean the X coordinate of the cut point. Just roll with it. Bigger than candle one and less than candle two. Or if candle two happens to be less than candle one, then it needs to be bigger than candle two and less than candle one. And because of the way I've drawn the 3D cube in my possibility space, that those two options are equally possible. If I hadn't done that, I would have ended up with half a cube actually as a possibility space if I forced candle one to be the leftmost candle, whatever. Uh, you can do it like that if you want to. Let's just go both ways. Instead of, uh, well, you can plot inequalities. I could say I want X to be less than Y because X is my coordinate for the uh, candle and candle one and Y is for candle two. And it plots it nicely. You can see it's in that sort of top half of the XY plane uh, on that side, but it's uh, 
not very good judge we're doing this with three-dimensional inequalities you start putting z's in here and it it seems to squash it down so we're, i'm not going to write that inequality i'm just going to write uh the get a plane where this changes is when when x is uh less than y it means x minus y uh, is actually less than zero and when it changes over it equals zero uh, and then it becomes bigger than zero so i'm going to draw the boundary when is when when that equals zero uh, let's just type that in again i'm making sure i've clicked on the the 3d view first i'll show you why in a sec if we click on the 3d view go to the text x minus y equals zero and there we have that vertical plane which separates the two regions i need to worry about and actually you can see the point is on one side of the plane at the moment if i switch the candle positions over it goes to the other side of that plane so that is basically the condition x less than y or x greater than y incidentally if it doesn't do what you expect it's because if you clicked on the non 3d view on the graphics view and you do the same command x minus y equals zero it draws the line because it thinks you want a two-dimensional version and the intersection of that three-dimensional plane with the two-dimensional x y plane is a line and it's trying to be context dependent and that can be confusing if you can't remember which of the last screens you clicked on or it did something different last time you tried it you can tell this just happened to me can't you good uh so we've got that plane uh, we'll work on one side at a time when i'm in the sort of top half so on the far side where the point currently is is when candle one is less than candle two and then for it to be a success i need a cut point to the uh so this is the z coordinate of my 3d space to be bigger than the x coordinate uh, and less than the y coordinate so let's think about how that works first of all uh, uh z bigger than x is z minus x bigger than zero so let's draw the plane for z minus x equals zero uh, that's the boundary and actually wanted to be so you can see i've already chopped uh, a diagonal line here i need to be above that point above that plane for this to be excess a success and i need uh, z to be less than y so let's do uh, y minus z equals zero to get the other boundary and i draw that plane and you see uh, it's the confusing thing is which side of the planes you're on we'll draw it in a sec but you, uh, these are the planes which are going to bound it now it's hard to see when they're full planes like this the judge is quite good at drawing this and then maybe if i let that spin you see this will work when i'm in the region between the two you can see the red changing as i go over that, but you can't quite see the crossover there it's underneath that plane and it goes up and then it goes above the plane there uh, but if i switch this all over then it needs to be the other way around uh, and i'm in on the other side of this thing so we're in the other half plane there so how to visualize this better i'm going to turn these planes off although they're quite useful to have in the background and just realize that it is the sort of pointy shapes so well maybe maybe i do want these planes on let's figure out how to draw this thing stop spinning for once i don't need to spin uh, let's visualize it up there and maybe i draw the line segment uh, from corner to corner here and this is where it might be useful to turn the coordinates back on let's find them which one? one 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 is one i want there in fact i probably want all of them on let's just turn them all on for now and draw some lines between them so i'm going to use a line segment tool still in the 3d mode here uh, maybe i turn the planes off so i can't click on them by mistake i'm going to draw a line between e which i think happens to be the origin yes it is and this point which is k now that's one edge of my region as that was kind of the dividing line vertically but then if i turn the planes on again where, where am i talking about here i want to draw the space that is in between these planes over here so i'm going to draw a triangle this one here and you see that's one part one boundary of the region of one so that the plane doesn't extend off to infinity what i want is a, a pyramid off the back of that and it's not sort of vertical but there's a pyramid tool which i can use here so um a tetrahedron tool what does that do let's find, let's find out what that does select two points or other corresponding objects that's not clear to me if i start typing what, what will that do tetrahedron point 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 uh three points to make a tetrahedron i don't want a regular tetrahedron i just want a, a, a pyramid okay here's a pyramid command maybe, maybe that's what i want so how does this work select the polygon for bottom then select top point i think i can do that so i'm going to click on the pyramid tool let's delete this thing pyramid uh, i've just made a polygon which is called itself where is it triangle t1 so i could click on it down here to be sure uh, and select the point yeah that's doing what i want the point is going to be the origin down here which is e stop moving that shape is what i wanted to make so let's turn the planes off and see how it looks i think that's what i wanted 
And now you can see that when the point is inside that region, it's red. And if it goes outside the region, if I start moving these things around, it goes blue as it leaves the, uh, the tetrahedron there. So it is a tetrahedron, but I wasn't using the tetrahedron command, which I think tries to draw a regular tetrahedron. I'm not sure about that. I'm just using the pyramid command. Uh, and I want to do a similar one on the other side, <coughs> which should be easy to do. Let's stop the spinning so I can access it. Uh, where's the side going to be? It's going to be... Uh, let's draw a triangle again. <coughs> there, to there, to there. Finish it off. Do I finish it? <coughs> and I want to use the pyramid command. I wonder, what does the pyramid command to do when I type it? Polygon on point. So actually, I could just do that. Polygon, I presume, is going to be called T2. I've just made that. So T2 and the point, I think, E is my origin. There it is. Now, this is hard to see, and it's much easier to see when it's spinning. Those two tetrahedra are the region we are being successful in our cut being between the candles thing. And actually, if you know the formula for pyramids, it's not entirely hard to figure out that each of those, if you look at a base of one of those pyramids, has a base of half of the square, so it's an area of half, and a height of one, third times a half times one is a sixth, and there are two of them, so what they make a third of that cube volume. Now it's much nicer, though, to do a nice thing where you could rotate one of these tetrahedra to make a nice square-based pyramid, which is even more obviously taking up a third of that cube. I'm going to leave that as a challenge. Uh, if you want a hint, what you do is maybe define one of these tetrahedra, which you hide, and have another when you hide under certain conditions and have another slider which is the rotation of that tetrahedron or an angle which rotates it and it rotates around to sort of lock into the pyramid shape. Um, I'll make sure the original file I made which does do that is linked you can go and have a play but try and solve that yourself. I think this is enough for now what we've got is a visualization of the cake and the candles problem. The candles move around, the, uh, the cut point moves around uh, and it pops up some text and changes color when we are between and that's a nice way of visualizing this problem. Uh, instead of ordering these things, we're literally using three-dimensional space to represent the three variables and realizing it becomes a volume thing. And I think I made the point in the number four video that that's, even if you'd solve this question by other means and then realized it could be represented as a three-dimensional space problem, you've therefore proved that the volume of a pyramid is a third of the base times height or the volume of the pyramid that we could make from joining these two together, which is a square-based pyramid based on this cube, is a third of the entire cube. And that's a nice thing. We do need to make some files uh, which represent the simula simulations that we did in this video and we will try and squeeze that into the end of this video so that's coming up in a moment confession time the eagle eyed among you would have spotted uh, if you were paying attention maybe it's not just the eagle eyes it's, if you're paying attention you look spotted i made a mistake uh, in my boolean bit earlier um having talked a lot about the fact that it could be either way around if it's between the candles that way around it's fine uh, but it could be that candle two is smaller than candle one, and you'll notice that my Boolean thing is not picking up this idea because the way I defined it is it's only checking if the cut point is bigger than candle one uh, and less than candle two. Now, there are loads of other ways I could have done this better, but I'm just going to fix this now because I've just realized it, and I know that some of you will be upset. So I'm going to put brackets around that condition and just do another condition uh, and use an or command between them. And I did mention that, so maybe it feels like it's come back to bite me. That should have gone through it. So the or command, uh, I'm going to use a double bar. Uh, mm. I'm never quite sure what that key is called on my. Uh, let me let me show you on my on my keyboard is this key that I'm pointing to. Hold on, I'm, I'm watching on the camera trying to spot this. There we go. Now that key there next to my Z key, I'm holding down Shift and do that. Whether that's a backslash or a forward slash, top of it is a bar, and two of them mean the OR command. Then you'll see in a minute, Judge will change that to a more convenient OR symbol, but it's a useful shortcut just as a double ampersand will do an AND thing. Anyway, now the condition needs to be the same thing uh, as I just had, but with candle one and candle two switch. So I'm just going to copy that condition uh, and change that candle two, candle one, and then we should still get the red and the text pop up. Let's check. So now candle two is less than candle one, then it should go red and pop up some text if we go between them. There we go. It's now working either way around, which is a relief, but I missed that. And that's quite important because I want to re uh, reestablish this Boolean thing in the next bit. Anyway, so I'd squeeze that in there before anyone writes to me and is upset.
Okay, let's talk about the simulation of some of these experiments. And the first thing I should say is that GeoGebra is really good at visualizing the things like we did in the previous bit, which a two-dimensional bit of geometry, algebra, and an equivalent three-dimensional bit and making it interactive. It's a really nice way to almost get your hands dirty, move things around, even though they're abstract things. What GeoGebra is less well-equipped to do is run large-scale simulations, but it can do, and you saw me do it in the video. Uh, I'm just saying that if you want to do large simulations and run it quickly, do it in a proper programming language. Maybe Python is a good e example. But the fact you can do it in GeoGebra and show visual results is nice. It's just never going to be as quick as something which is doing it properly coding. Anyway, having said that, Let's do it anyway, because there's a useful bit of uh, GeoGebra scripting to demonstrate, I think, here. And anything you like, it feels like GeoGebra doesn't have a, a neat way to do a loop, which most programming languages do when you want to repeat stuff. But there are ways of making that happen, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. So let us do uh, the simulation of the two dimensional, or rather the one dimensional cake and candles problem before we go into two dimensions, which is where the problems start. But let's get the simulation working first. And to do that, I'm going to make, just like we did previously, I'm going to make three points that are going to simulate the, the cut and the candles. Uh, I'm going to change the definition of these. So I just put them randomly here because actually every time I run a loop that I'm going to do in a minute, I'm going to set them to be a random place. But let's just name them. I've put them on the axes for now. They do drag around, but I'm going to make, make them move with a, a scripting command. First of all, though, let's name them. I could have just renamed, but uh, yeah, let's just do the rename command. It's going to be quicker. Let's make this be candle one. I'll stick with the same naming convention I did before. Let's make this be candle two. Uh, and I'll make this be the cut position or the cut line or the cut point. Let's just go with that. When these move around, they're not limited actually. But since I don't really want to be dragging them, I just want them to be assigned randomly. I'm just going to leave it at that because all I'm going to do is make a button in GeoGebra. That's a way of running a little script and make that give these random positions. Because uh, that's the point, you're meant to put candles down at random between 0 and 1 in our simulation and cut somewhere at random. So let's make a button. Uh, the button command here, I just click on the screen somewhere for the button to exist and it gives me an, a box to enter the caption. So let's just say randomize. Should that be a Z? Sorry Americans if you think it's a Z. I'm just going to use an S. And we're going to also check whether it's between or not. But uh, we need a Boolean thing for that which we talked about just a moment ago. Uh, and then it asks you for the script. So if you clicked OK here, we'll just make a button which does nothing. But this is a chance if you want to straight away tell it to do something when you click on it. A GeoGebra script is a way of saying, do these GeoGebra commands, which is incidentally why it's worth knowing how to type commands into GeoGebra and not just do the buttons. Because if you can type a command in, then you can put it in a script. And in this case, there are commands to randomize stuff. Um, but yeah, let what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the value of the three points. And this is a really important scripting command to change the value of something. Use the command set value. And then it wants the, the name of the object you're going to set the value. In this case, it was called A, so I've just renamed it to be candle one. And then it wants the value you want it to set it to. So this is like updating a variable. It's a little bit more cumbersome than just saying candle one equals, but it's the same idea. Uh, so set value of candle one to be a coordinate. And I want it to be a random point between zero and one, that's what random open close brackets does, and with a y coordinate of zero. Uh, and I want to close the correct number of brackets, and let's close the, the point and that. And then let's do a set value of candle two. Similarly, I want that to have a, it's going to be exactly the same. I should have just copied and pasted and changed one letter. Let's do that for the next one. So copy that. And the cut point is going to be there, but this time I'm not changing one letter, I'm changing that to cut point. And you'll see that what this button does is it just makes these things move around. Fingers crossed. So uh, make sure you're not on the button tool. You're back on the arrow tool. Otherwise, or press escape to do that. And then you can click the button. And it's making them move around. And they're not doing anything other than going between 0 and 1. That's because the random open close brackets gives you a random number between 0 and 1. And you can see them turning up here. Worth mentioning, there are other random commands. If you start typing random, you see there's a whole bunch of them. The one with the lower case is like a built-in command, like... Uh, sine or cosine or I think things which are built into the mathematics of GeoGebra it just goes between 0 and 1 a bit like the random button on most electronic calculators whereas the capitals so random between random discrete uh, is, is basically doing a bit more statistical command built into the back end of GeoGebra uh, so if you wanted to simulate what we just done a random uniform between 0 and 1 would do the same thing but it's much easier just to like random open close brackets However, you can see there are lots of ways of generating re generate random numbers from normal distribution or from a binomial, all sorts of things. Another video, perhaps, if I haven't done one already on those things. However, 
Uh, this is doing the right thing. It's not checking anything yet, but it is randomizing those positions. And if I repeatedly do that and was able to check whether it was between or not between, we should be able to simulate Monte Carlo while, uh, style whether this is approximating that one third answer we thought it should earlier. Uh, let's check. So we need some way of checking where they are between. And this is where what we just did uh, to check the other one. If the cut is between, we want a Boolean value here. Um, actually, I'm going to try and do it without an if command here. Let's see. Let's try x of candle one less than x of cut point. Also less than x of candle two. That's one success. I'm going to just try the or command straight away and do it the other way around. So let's just copy that. Uh, and then change the numbers because they could go either way around and let's see if that's working I, I, let's see if it works it it's saying false at the moment if i move it around that goes true and goes false and if i change it the other way around false true false okay so i think that's doing what it should you notice i can move these anywhere it's just that my randomize and check is going to move them between zero and one so this time anytime we're hitting a true we've got a select thing so all i've got to do is basically find some way of looping this and counting the number of trues out of the number of times I've checked. And that is uh, not obvious how to do in JoJira until you realize you can run a slider in the background and that slider has a scripting command on an update. Every time that slider updates, it would run some script and that's how we're going to repeatedly do something. So let's make a slider which is going to control our loop. Uh, so I'm going to make a slider. I quite often call this TT. I don't know why. Uh, maybe I'm just going to use T because the idea is this is time quite often use double variables so that does sometimes come back to bite me because it looks like it's t times t then whatever i'm going to call it t i'm going to it doesn't really matter what it runs between i'm going to go between zero and one i'm going to let it go 100 times between zero and one but it really doesn't matter all i want this to do is every time it changes its value i.e if it's animating continuously it's going to be constantly changing its value i want it to run a command uh, so let's just let's just define it like that and it doesn't do anything at the moment but what I'd like it to do is when we when it's animating, so I could just animate, every time that changes, I want it to run a script. And I've already got a script in that button I've just made, and there is a command to run a script attached to a button. So let's try it. In practice, it doesn't really matter whether this is going up or down, but if I go to the properties and scripting, every object has a scripting thing on an update of this object, I would like it to run the click script of button. What is the, where's my button? My button is not visible on here. Let's turn it, yeah, it's an auxiliary object. So actually I'm going to make it not an auxiliary object so I can see it. it's called button one. And I'm going to run click script. That's the command you need. It doesn't also complete in the scripting things, which is annoying. Ah, and that's on the wrong thing. So I want to be doing this on slider T. Let's get this right. Run click script, brackets button one. Should really have renamed that button to be something better. Yeah, let's go with it, whatever. And that's it. Every time the slider changes, it's going to run the click script. Let's see what happens if I let this animate. We're hopefully seeing this just flicker around. Let's animate this. Great. Now it's not doing any counting, but you can see it's flicking between false and true. And this is just on a permanent thing now. If I change the speed of this, this would be the way to change how quickly that loop runs. Uh, let's make it go 10 times quicker. But it, it will in practice hit a sort of limit of processing and to also to do with the increment uh, and speed of this slider. But it's a way of looping things in JoJo, which we talked about in maybe other videos. But neat way, if something is on the update command of a slider and that slider is animating quickly, then it should be doing this thing repeatedly. So what we really need to do is keep count. Let's stop this thing from animating. Uh, where do we need to keep count? Well, we need a couple of variables. Let's have a, a variable called trials, which I'll call zero to start with. And I'll also have a variable called successes, uh, which I'll also start at zero. <coughs> and I think we're going to need eventually a button to reset this. Um, so let's make a button called reset. And this will do a set value of trials to be zero. It'll reset whatever we've got there, the trials number to be zero. And we'll also set the value of successes to be zero. I would also like a way to trigger this animation. So I'm going to make a tick box for that, uh, which is just going to say animate. No, uh, re repeat. What should we say? repeatedly check and this is normally a tick box is saying oh do you want to hide or show stuff no i don't so i'm just going to leave that blank this is just a tick box that does nothing but i'm going to let this control the animation of p and if i reset that's 
resetting these things that they're, they're not doing that. so when are they going to increase they're going to increase every time i randomize and check so let's change in the uh randomize button what happens when we script that so watch out buttons have an on update script as well but actually you want them to run on click uh and we've randomized points let's do a way of checking set value trials to be trials plus one that way it'll always increment the number of trials this is equivalent to plus equals in is that in python i forget which programming language i'm thinking in now slightly cumbersome but it works and i also want to set the value of the successes to go up if we have been successful so the set value of successes should be successes which i've done a shorter name now i wish i could type the comma plus one but that should be wrapped in an if command i think so if cut between is a boolean value if that's true which is just if cut between then do that and i don't have to say otherwise otherwise it's going to do nothing so i think that's it it's going to always increment the trials by one and then if we are successful uh it's going to integrate integrate the successes by one. i don't know if this is going to work let's just try it if i do a couple of these i can see the trials going up each time and successes occasionally going up and occasionally not going up uh now i just need to animate the thing so let's get the tick box doing that when i update the boolean here i want to start the animation or stop it depending on what the boolean is so start animation of t based on whatever the boolean value a is so if a has been ticked to become true it will start animation true and if it's false it will update and say it will start animation t false and it'll stop it and i think that's all i want i think the only other thing i need to say is that the reset should stop the animation so maybe let's just do set value of a to be false in that case oh that's on click i think i'm gonna do it so resetting stops it does it also stop the animation let's find out if i click this it should animate yay and it's counting successes quite quickly what i really need is the ratio can i type this in while it's going uh, success ratio equals successes over trials I would uh, I want that to be a decimal probably let's stop this will that stop it yeah uh interesting why is it giving me a fraction i guess it, it how do i get a decimal how do i force it to be a a number surprises me that's doing it i wonder if it'll eventually is it in advanced algebra oh i can turn off symbolic ah there we go so symbolic is giving me a fraction if if it can and if not it's giving me a decimal i was hoping it to be around a third it's easier to see when it's a decimal let's just run this again i probably want to see more decimal places view no options rounding let's go five decimal places yeah there we go it is close to a third not exact but this is kind of what i expect it's already done a thousand trials uh, let's stop it and reset and hopefully lose all our data there we go and the success ratio doesn't exist because it's doing zero divided by zero at the moment uh, good uh that's the first bit of trial and error and if i just run this again it should very quickly tend towards third if you want this visible on screen by the way you can just drag these on uh, trials successes the success ratio and we could tidy that up later on if we want to but that's just aesthetic stuff which we've done a lot of talking about um let's consider upgrading to the two-dimensional model and that's where the fun starts okay it's time to go two-dimensional you may have noticed the lighting's changed i've been thinking about this bit for a while and it got dark and i want to finish this but uh some interesting math happens in the two-dimensional uh case when you upgrade from one dimension to two dimension and this is where when i talked on the number file video i thought a lot about what grant sanderson was talking about with brady on a different number file video about bertrand's paradox which is all to do with cutting uh, a chord through a circle and you be on, might begin to see how this overlaps if you haven't watched the other number four videos though this doesn't make a lot of sense however uh there are some interesting maths that i haven't really fully got to the bottom of yet and i'm not the only person who's dived down this rabbit hole i'll reference a couple of other videos that uh, are worth watching uh to think about this however let's build the jojoba thing which is kind of what this video is about and let's start with upgrading from a rectangular cake or a one-dimensional cake essentially which is what we were doing to a two-dimensional square cake and let's get that working first before we go on to the traditional circular cake which uh, is where things get a bit less obvious however there's enough things to think about to i've just got upgraded two dimensions particularly when you're dealing with random stuff so let's build a square i've got a blank 
Jojbra file again, uh, but the construction I just did, I'm going to sort of recreate in, now just in two dimensions. So let's really quickly make a little square cake. Uh, just going to put these points around the edge and we'll draw some segments to sort of to, to join it up. So this is going to be our cake. And actually, I don't need these points labeled. I just want this outline visible for aesthetic reasons. And I want three. Well, I want two points to appear on there. First of all, let's I don't need to label these. In fact, I probably don't need the points. Let's get rid of them. Uh, so let's fill our page with this. I'm going to put uh, a couple of positions for candles and let's rename them. They're not anywhere particular. I'm going to randomize them in a moment, but that's candle one. This is the same naming convention we had before, but notice they now can be anywhere in two dimensions. And then you realize, well, how do you pick a random place and direction to cut? A random cut, what does that even mean now? It's not just a random position and then you cut perpendicular feels like there's more dimensions to play with here. There's literally another dimension to play with here. So the first reaction I had was like, well, I'll pick a random point on the screen or on the cake, and then I'll pick a random angle. And there's only one way of randomizing it. If it's the only way remains to be seen, uh, you can tell by my tone of voice that it's probably not. However, we'll just do that for now. So I'm going to make a cut point. Uh, I'm going to rename that to be cut point, but I'm also going to make an angle. I'm going to call it cut angle which is zero at the moment but let's um let's use that to determine what angle that cut goes so first of all let's make this cut uh i think what we're going to do is have it go through the cut point but at an angle that's rotated by that cut angle so uh, how, how can we do that can we do it in one go i want a line through cut point parallel to the x-axis but i also want that rotated uh about an angle cut angle which at the moment is zero about the point cut point i always type m for commas when i'm in a hurry mind. so just to recap i've got a line through this horizontal parallel line is just parallel to the x-axis but i'm also then rotating it by cut angle around cut point and if i make cut angle change to say like two then it's spun that around and this should move with it okay so I, what i want to do is, is have these get randomized so let's make a button that does all that Use a button let's call it randomize um let's do all the points so we're going to set the value of candle one and how do we pick a random point in this unit square well it's relatively easy i think to convince yourself that a random random which gives you an x distribution of uniform zero to one and a y distribution uniform zero to one it's going to pick a random point in the square and each point is going to be equally likely and i don't think that's really hard to convince yourself about the same for candle two uh, and the same for the cut point as well i want that to, to go anywhere whether or not that's enough we'll talk about in a moment but then i also need the cut angle so set value cut angle to be let's go run random times two pi then it's going to pick any direction i could because it's a an infinite line maybe i could just go pi and it'll go between one way or another. But let's just let's go the full. I don't think it'll make a difference. Uh, so let's click the button and see what happens. Error in your script. Undefined variable random. Interesting. Uh, what's it trying to do? Oh, I need the brackets. There we go. Uh, first debug done. Yay, that seems to be working. Uh, I don't need that line J to be vis visible labeled, but I do need it visible. That's not between. So what I need to do now is a detection of whether it is between, and that's slightly less obvious. It's not it's just a question of greater or less. I've got two dimensional things. So I'm going to use some inequalities. Basically, this line is a function. I wonder if I can actually make it a function. I think I can. I think I did this before. Um, in JoJo, at the moment, it's a line. It's got J. It's not a function called J, but I could make it. If I do j of x and force it to try and take an input, I think that'll give me a function. Yes, it's called it p, which I'm going to rename. Uh, let's just call it the function cut. I think it gives me quality. Yeah, I don't need that label there. In fact, I don't even need to be divisible. Just the line is good. But now it's a function, I can use it as an inequality. So, for example, I could say y less than cut. Uh, let's just type that in here. Y less than cut of x. And it's colored in that region. In fact, what's that region called? That's called capital A. I think that's okay to name it like that. So, and now I can just check, basically, for this to be between, I need one of the candles to be in and one of them out. 
not both in and not both out. So I just need to think about the, the Boolean logic here. Let's call it cut between like we did before. Um, and there's a useful command in Jojo called is in region, which we'll try in a moment. So the cut between is going to be um, either, and let's construct this. I, I want an or command here. So I'm going to put brackets and an or thing. That looks really confusing. But let's say is in region. Yeah, there. that's the command. Is in region. I want candle two to be in the region A. And I need the not. Not not is in region. And the one in A. I think that's it. So that's saying I want candle two to be in A and not candle one to be in A. Or the the inverse, converse, reverse? Uh oh. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to change the numbers. You can uh, correct me in the comments uh, if I forgot my logical things. I think that's it. Let's check. Well, and certainly the cut is between at the moment, and it should go to false when I go there. False. Uh, false. And I like it. Now let's just check if they're the other way around, that we're okay. Good. That condition is working. I can hide that inequality. So that is in region is a really useful uh, logical check if you're working in some sort of geometrical space. So I think that's my detection. Now I just need to keep checking for it so let's uh first of all make a slider to start animating this thing let's let it go from i don't know why i'm changing this i don't think it really matters I just want it to move quickly uh but i'm used to sliders going like that let's change the properties of this to be going quickly and when it updates i want to run that randomize button i've just done run click script button one i presume it's button one it's, it's an auxiliary item at the moment so i can't see it let's just make that visible there it is <laughs> and if I animate that we should just get lots of updates good um I want to keep track of whether it's between or not so let's introduce some numbers n for the number I'm going to use n for the number of trials it's easier to quick so to type easier to quick I am in a hurry successes can I still type this word that's going to be zero and let's do the ratio which is successes out of n and maybe let's get them nice and visible on the screen we can move this around another time if we want to what why is it just just moving ratio i want one of them i think i wasn't on the arrow tool there's the n and there's the successes okay uh and let's just no they need to get updated every time i run this button so i better put that in the script on click set value n to be n plus one that always goes up and if we have a cut between then set value successes to be successes plus one. I think that's it. I'm going to need a reset button. I'll do that in a moment. Let's see what happens here. Interesting. Good. That seems to be working. Let's make a reset button to just be able to easily get everything back to where we started. So this is going to be set value n to be zero and set value successes to be also zero i think we probably also want an animate tick box let's do that animate and we'll change the scripting on this so that it starts the animation p according to the boolean p i've just made up and maybe on the reset we can just tell it to set value b to be that will stop the animation when we reset it okay let's check it all works that animates nicely and if i reset everything stops uh if i randomize that just does one that's nice and i can get you to go really quickly obviously i can hide the the t uh oh it goes, it goes even quicker when i do that that's worth realizing just animating that slider is slowing it down i think it's going quicker i don't know. I think it's my imagination and i can reset it like that okay um, you may have noticed that the proportion it was tending towards is very quickly uh, seeming to be around 0.33. Now, if I just increase the rounding so we can check that. Uh, it does feel like it's re reinforcing our earlier conclusion. But we have an issue here is that how do I know that I'm actually choosing a random cut? I feel like I am choosing a random point uh, and a random angle that goes with it. But there are other ways to choose parts of this cake so 
maybe I could choose two points on the edge of the cake and draw a line between them. And uh, it would end up giving me a different probability, which is slightly disconcerting. So let me upgrade from the square to the circle, which is what I talked a lot about in the number file, and link it back to Bertrand's paradox, which is what Grant talked about in the other number file video. Uh, and uh, well, we can get some nice animations, but also leave some interesting uh, conclusions. Because actually upgrading to a circle in itself causes some issues. And I think we can adapt this file to do that. So instead of actually, uh, let, let's just hide these lines for the circle. Let's say we want to put this whole thing inside a circle. And actually that's not too bad because I'm just, ooh, these things I don't really want to move around. So I'm actually going to put them over here and then leave them still for a bit. So absolute position on screen. And now when I drag them, they don't move. Okay. So these points only get allocated positions by the button here. So I'm going to change what happens here. Now, maybe I'll just draw a circle, uh, radius one from the center, a unit circle, and that's the cake we're going to work on now. And it would be nice to get this working on a circular cake because that feels like the traditional format of a cake. However, how do you choose a point in a circle? Uh, it's not obvious to me. With a square, it's really easy. You just do random X, random Y. Uh, and it guaranteed you a uniform distribution. Um, with a circle working in polar coordinates seems to be sensible. So you could choose a random uh, angle and then a random distance between zero and one. If you do that, it doesn't quite do what you expect. So let me just try it with candle one. If I change the uh, the script here, so set value candle one to be, uh, and this is by the way, if you don't remember how to use polar coordinates in GeoGebra, a semicolon is a friend, but I'm going to do a random distance, semicolon, a random number, times 2 pi. So that's going to be a random number between 0 and 1 for the radius and a random number between 0 and 2 pi for the angle. Uh, and we'll just we'll just comment out the rest for now. We'll just leave it as it is. Uh, don't need any of that. The hash is a useful comment in JoJavaScript. So we're just going to let the candle one roam around now. Let's just check that does what we think it does. Yeah, bouncing around. However, if I trace it, you'll see that this is not a uniform distribution. Um, it's not counting how many distributions it is, but if I let this run for a while, and I might speed it up uh, while I'm talking, you can see that it's not spreading out equally over this circle. It's definitely clustering more in the middle, and that's because if you pick a random distance and a random angle, uh, the ones at a further distance are spread around at a random angle. They're, they're covering the area more sparsely. They're less dense out there, whereas everything packed in this, the same basically the same number of points at every distance, approximately, if you let this go for a long time. Uh, and the rings in the near the center are much smaller area than the rings on the outside, but they have the same number of points in. So this is not distributing the candle or any point evenly. And the answer of how to put a point randomly in a circle um, is non-trivial. I'm not the first to find this. Um, when I was talking to Grant about this, I was asking, how, how Grant, how did you pick a random point in a circle? And um, he pointed out, first of all, that actually someone in the Summer of Math Exposition, which he ran last summer, a competition for people to make some nice maths videos on YouTube. Uh, you should get involved if he ever does it again, by the way. Um, someone submitted a video on this exact problem. How do you pick a random point uniformly inside a circle? Because this is not the way, despite it feeling like a nice polar way of doing it. Um, to cut a long story short, the one easy way to do it is just to pick a random point in the square and reject it if it's outside the circle. That's great if you're going to do it in Python or something which you've got a nice way of looping things and you just do it until it's correct and you can have, you can have a while loop or something like that. In GeoGebra, it's less obvious uh, because there's not an easy way to do that. But in a completely equivalent way, and I'm going to point you to a video where this is explained, is to do uh, take the square root of the radius that you pick randomly uh, as well as just a random angle. And that does distribute it. And that kind of makes sense because of an area scaling factor. The squares and square roots are quite often to do, involved when you scale up from linear things to two-dimensional things. Um, I remember coming across this with the sunflower spiral I did when you, you want to plot the point at the square root of its point number. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go and watch the video made about the sunflower spirals. Uh, however, watch so the video that I'm linking to up there, uh, which was entered to the Random Summer of Maths exhibition. Summer of Maths exposition. 
uh, the Grant Run, um, and it's a brilliant little video by a first timer. Uh, I think that was their first video on YouTube, and it deserves all the credit it gets. But they solved the problem. Let me show you what it looks like if you change the the way of distributing this to make it work. So we're going to take just the, just do the square root of that random number, uh, and we'll reset our trace and see what happens. And this is this is very pleasing. Uh, Control F to change that, and let's just uh, animate this again. And this time, uh, I'll speed this up again while I'm talking. Uh, that this does distribute uniformly over the circle because actually it's it's pushing more points towards the edges. If you take the square root of a number less than one, it's going to uh, tend towards one. Uh, you go and try that if you don't believe me. And so it's actually pushing the points uh, away at just exactly the right rate for that to be spread uniformly. Right, so with that solved, in terms of we can pick a random point on the circle now, uh, let's upgrade the rest of it. I'm going to stop this animation and just make everything work again. Uh, let's change the other scripting things. So we need the candle 2 to have something similar. We can just grab the same formula. And I think that's a valid way of picking a candle on the circle. Cake, circle cake. Um, but we still have the issue of how to choose a cut. And this is exactly the problem that Grant discussed at length with Brady on that number five video, which if you haven't watched yet, for goodness sake, I've mentioned it enough times. How do you choose a random chord on a circle? And it turns out this is not well defined, but it feels like there are well defined ways. So, for example, you could pick two endpoints. You could pick two points around the circle uh, and join them up. And that would be random in some sense. It would be uniform random because those points could be anywhere and you get a distribution of chords. Is that random? Well, yes, but there are other ways to do it that give you different outcomes. However, let's program this and we, st we start to see the differences here. And there's a couple of nice Jojo things I get to show you along the way. So uh, let's, I want, still want the increments to be going, but let's see if we can get something else happening. I'm going to make uh, several versions of this so we can compare the two. I think what we need to do is maybe make some points first before we can uh, start scripting. So let's close that, uh, clear that. Um, okay, let's make some... One way of making a chord for this cut is to define some random points on the circle. So let's make these two... Well, I... I'm not going to attach them to the circle. I'm just going to make a couple of points, E and F. And I'm going to define them in the script to be points on the circle. So let's just do that. So every time we randomize it, we set a value of E. And I want it to be a point on the circle. And that's relatively easy to do with polar coordinates. I would like it to be at a radius of 1 and an angle of random times 2 pi. And that should do us. Have I closed that coordinate? And I've closed the set value. Let's do the same with F. Maybe I should have named them better, but I think that's going to work. Let's just see what happens when I click that. So they, they go around down and I can draw the chord between them. So actually, let me just hide line J for now. Let's just make the segment between E and F. I've done it with a tool for a change. I hardly ever use the tools these days. And now when I randomize it, we can get a random chord. I actually might have the entire line. So having said that, I just wanted a segment. I'm actually going to use the entire line because you get some pretty effects anyway. And this is all about prettiness in the end. Uh, I'll stop candle one getting traced because that's leaving a bit of a, a mess. Okay. So that this is an equally valid way of getting a chord. It's different from my cut point business. Uh, but we could still use that previous idea of it, but let, let's just see what happens now. So let's make, how do we make, we made this a function before. So that line is called K. Let's call it uh, end point cut of X equals K of X. Yeah, so now I've got a function called end point cut. That's fine. And I guess we want to check whether the cut between I get so let's let's define a general cut. I, I want to have several options going here at once. Maybe we'll just do that all together. These are in the way now a bit. Doesn't really matter, does it? Um, how do I define whether I'm just trying to keep this efficient? I guess I just copy the cut between. And 
and let's define a region again. So this is going to be y less than endpoint cut. That's called itself D. Do I want to bother renaming this to be helpful? Probably, but I'm not going to. Uh, and let's just define our cut between. So endpoint cut between. That's a long name. Is a boolean and this time we're just going to use d for the region and we use the same candles so that's fine hopefully that is going to work endpoint cut between is a boolean it's false at the moment can i drag these yes i can it's gone true false okay so now if we randomize it, it seems to be working so that's one way of defining it and now we can check the successes uh, in our script again. Let's get something like this. So if endpoint cut between, and we're going to need some other different successes. Let, yeah, let's do endpoint successes. I better define what that number is. I'm making some crazy, uh, crazy variable names, but that's fine. I think. Let's find endpoint successes equals zero and let's reset everything. See what happens. Um, I do want to see these numbers. So let's sort it by object type. So now I can see these numbers. So endpoint successes are one. Let's just let's just animate this. See what happens. Right, so the endpoint successes are notably lower. The cut point is not varying at all, so I shouldn't trust that one. Let's let's just drag that on and see what happens. Maybe I'll get a ratio. Endpoint ratio equals endpoint successes. Short, who needs short variables over in? Ah, oh, it's done me a fraction again. It's a nice bit. Why does that sometimes happen? And sometimes not. Uh, I'm gonna. I think I did solve it by turning off symbolic. Okay, let's just animate this. Well, it's definitely a lower ratio than what we had before. Interesting. I think it's doing what it should. Definitely. Where are my booleans? There. Let's just check. That's between true, false, true, false, true, false. Yep. And so how else could we define chords across a circle? Well, in the video, we did it another way by maybe you do pick a random point in the circle. We use that to define the midpoint of a chord because every point in the circle is the midpoint of a unique chord. And so I can do that with my cut point. Let's just use that again. But this time, uh, let's make the cut point defined better. So the cut point is going to be the square root like we had before of a random point and it's going to be a polar coordinate at an angle of random times two pi and now the cut point should run around i'm ignoring the cut angle for now because that's something i can introduce again later but now i want this to define a midpoint uh, so how do i get that uh midpoint of a chord is perfect so if i if i made the segment from the origin to cut point uh that would be yeah that's that line but i want to find the perpendicular to that that goes through cut point so let's do perpendicular line perpendicular line through cut point and then that's the line I want it to be perpendicular to it. There we go. So that's the chord. And every if I move this around, you can see that it, it does always define a chord everywhere. Right? But there's most of the circle is it's quite tangential. There's very few points that go across their center. Anyway, it's genuinely a random chord. And now if I randomize, that is randomizing. And the cut is updating. Is is the cut updating? No, I haven't. That line is different, isn't it? So uh, that line I've just made. Where is it? L. 
justify cut to be L of X. And then we've got that ready made. So actually these successes are, uh, let's rename them successes. It's actually a chord defined by midpoint successes. And the ratio here is midpoint ratio. Right, I wonder, success is undefined. Ah, oh, my button talks about successes, so that's annoying. I have to go and change that in the other button as well. I also need the reset to do, to reset the other things. Endpoint successes. That should be all right. Uh, let's check this button. Mid point successes. I think that's going to update. Okay, let's try. And reset. Good. Anyway. Right. They're not the same, but they are converging. They do seem to be similar ish now. So maybe these two different ways of cutting the circle are converging. But it's not the only way we could choose to cut the circle, right? There's, we could do another way. We could do uh, pick a random point by choosing just like we did before. It's generally defining a point in the circle, but like um, a, a distance and an angle. And it's genuinely going to be some point in the circle, but it's not going to be uniform. However, we're not trying to get a uniform distribution. We're trying to get a random chord. So maybe it's valid to say that you, you choose a point somewhere between zero and one and you turn a bit and that will define the midpoint of a chord. And maybe that's a better distribution of chords. So we can start. Let, let's see what that is. So let's make a new point and uh, let's call this uh, a random, I think a radial point, but point oh, man this is too long but we're going to go with it uh, and that point is going to get defined by the sort of naive way we had of picking a point so set value radial point really did i make it this long radial point what did i call it cut point that's a bad name i'm going to go with it because i can't bother to go and change it so it's going to be a polar coordinate with random and then random times two pi. So I know full well that this isn't a uniform distribution, but this is trying to find a cut rather than a point. So maybe that's fine. We do need to define the chord that goes with that, just like I did before. How did I do it before? It was in this one. Yeah. So I'm going to grab that code. And this one is just going to go through radial cut point. Uh, I need the radial halo. Nice. Okay. <coughs> and like before, I need to get a function which defines that. Let's call it rad point cut. Variables are getting out of hand, Ben. And that's just going to be m of x. Nice. Okay. And then the inequality y less than rad point cut of x and i feel like i could have skipped some steps there and just uh, made the inequalities off those lines but hey we've, we've done it now and this time i want a oh i need to change the cut between let's call that mid cut between i'm going to change some scripts to do that And I want something similar to count, don't I? Uh, first of all, let's change the... Let's make a new rad point cut between... Are we, are we deep in coding hell right now? And this is now region E.
Okay. Let's check whether that works. True. False. True. False. Yeah, that's working. Okay. So we need some... Let's reset all this. Hasn't broken anything. We, we need number of trials. I need a, a success count. So let's call it rad point successes equals zero and a rad point ratio rad point ratio uh, equals rad point successes i've not been consistent with whether i type point or pt let's get them on the screen let's see what happens if i just randomize a few of these okay random like that. Ah, it's the brackets again. That's it. The rad. Wait, wait, is it? Is it ever going through? Is it just really unlikely? No, that went through and it didn't register it. Ah, because I haven't got a button registering it. That's why. Not a surprise. You're probably shouting at me. If, you, if you're still watching this, I'm kind of impressed. Uh, rad point cut between was the correct name. Then set value rad, let's call it PT, successes. So inconsistent. Let's see how many bugs we get this time. It's actually working it. Okay, let's just animate this thing and see what happens. Oh, the reset's not working. Let's uh, sort that out. It's not a great place to code when you get to this level of, of faff, but if you do it slowly, it does work. And this is all building relatively nicely. Let's just animate this thing. They don't look like they're the same numbers to me. So what I've done here is I've shown you three different ways of defining a random chord. And they definitely don't distribute the chords in the same way. And actually, if you go and look at the Wikipedia article on Bertrand's Paradox, I think these three methods are described and they have a nice little uh, visualization of what the chords look like as they're distributed and indeed what the midpoints of those chords look like. And uh, one of the problems is that when you're choosing a random point, uh, it's it seems to be actually easy to make a d uniform distribution of points on the circle. And we talked about it. But that doesn't necessarily mean you create a uniform distribution of chords if you define the chords off of those points. So maybe you do want to use just the radial point method, I've called the rad point thing here, to define the chords. Uh, and maybe what I'll finish with here is if you if you prettify this a bit, uh, we can make really quite stunning graphics of some of those diagrams that they've got on Wikipedia, but we can do that in JoJoBro. So let's just make that happen now. Uh, we'll do some prettification again. Okay, uh, let's make some tick boxes to hide and show the different methods here. This is hopefully going to be relatively easy, and I haven't done the, the as as much tidying up as I probably want to. But let's do the midpoint method, uh, and I'll sort out. Well, we can choose some things to hide and show here. So I think that's got the that was using E and F, and that cut there, <clears throat> and then we can hide and show those things. And we'll do something. I'll just tidy that up over here. Let's do something with the end point. Oh, I've done it the wrong way around, haven't I? That, uh, the midpoint method, I kind of retrospectively did that with by picking random points. So actually, the let's change that. And changing a, a tick box after the fact is slightly uh, non-intuitive. So it's called O, this thing. And I've made the points f e and line depend on o in its properties it is just a shortcut of typing the letter o in here so i'm going to delete that and now they don't depend on that this is still a tick box but it doesn't do anything <clears throat> what i want that to hide and show is this point here which is called cut point and that line l and i now just need to go and change those properties so i want that to depend on o and i want this line to depend on o and then they'll disappear when i turn that on and off okay and the endpoints 
were what I uh, tried and uh, hide, hid and shoot last time. Hid and shoot, hid and showed. Whatever. Feels like it's getting late. All right, that will hide and show those things, and oh, we're working up to a big conclusion to get a pretty picture. I hope you hope you appreciate this. And let's just do one more, which is the radial point method. Which doesn't distribute the point uniformly, but maybe that's fine. Uh, that's that point and that line. And then we've got neat ways then of hiding and showing all these things. We can turn it all off, and now we just we just get some candles animating. It's still doing the things in the background, uh, which yeah, I can I can leave that running here. Let, let, should we tidy it? I think we're going to tidy up. I can't really help myself. Uh, let's get those buttons up here. N is always going to be there. It doesn't snap too when you make it an absolute position on the screen, by the way, and that's slightly annoying. But the midpoint we can tack up under here. Uh, the endpoint method will go here. And I think these two might need to be made into an absolute position and the radial point method will go here. And it's tidier. I think we can turn the grid off. These two need to be absolute position. Uh, there we go. Maybe I can turn the axes off. We don't know. It was just a cake in the end, right? Uh, this is still animating and it resets okay. I'm going to save this before I uh, lose all this construction. It feels like this is a, a deep construction now. And uh, if I turn that on, then we can start tracing this thing. So let's make some colors nicer. So I'm going to make the background change color. The, 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 I happened upon a really nice color scheme that I just really like. So I'm going to make that happen again. What color was it? I think it was uh, 27. No, well, well, I'm choosing a background color. <clears throat> Give me the graphics properties, please. Graphics, graphics. Um, it's up here. I don't know why it's popping me in there. Anyway, the background color is white at the moment. Let's make it. What did I choose? What's that? The dark gray. No, I think I chose a. Chose a let's make one. 27, 0, 68. All right, everything's disappeared. But let's make the circle white. Uh, yeah, let's do the circle white. <clears throat> the candles feel like they should be visible. Uh, what color should we make them? Also white. Maybe they're always going to be there. We need to get our text visible. I'm just using right drag to make the uh, the text here. Can I change the color of these? Let's make that white so we can see them. Okay, there's more text up here. Uh, let's make that white as well and when they turn this on <clears throat> I like that line so I'm gonna do something slightly strange here I want, I want to make quite a subtle effect and I'm gonna do that by making this really not very opaque but actually gonna make a copy of itself so I'm gonna make um, I'm just gonna make another line which is called L did it do it no I would like Hmm. I want to create a copy which is different. So let's call it LL equals L. There we go. Let's just made a copy of the line. And that means I can make the line itself, <clears throat> maybe if I always make it really yellow and bright. Why is that not very bright? Object properties. Color, yellow, style. Ah, I can make it really opaque. Maybe a bit thicker. And it's because the other one's on top of it. Let's put let's change the uh, one to be on a different layer. It's in the advanced. Let's make that on layer. Always on top. There we go. But behind it, LL, I'm going to make the same color, but really not very opaque. And if that's the one I trace, we should get a subtle effect. Let's just try this. Okay, that's not very subtle. Uh, did I change the opacity? No, I didn't. I don't know. I think maybe I changed the thickness, did I? Let's make it really quite not thick and let's clear the traces. That was control F again. Can I make this? There we go. <clears throat> Gonna make it even less opaque. I really like the way this builds up very slowly if you can hardly see it at first. And you can just about see the traces, the the background line is leaving there. 
but it's only if they get repeated that they strengthen. This is a really nice way to see when you, if you're going to create lots of lines to see it building up. And you can see the pattern of lines that this midpoint method is making is actually dominated by the edges of the circle. And so randomly choosing a chord in this method by choosing a, mid, a random point in the circle and making that the midpoint of the chord actually tends to make chords that are close to the edge of the circle. And you might like to reflect on why that is. But I really like this is I just really like the way this looks. Um, to be honest, this is what I was going for in the entire video here. And even if there wasn't interesting maths going on, you can see, by the way, you can see these numbers are not converging on the same things. I, I don't know what they should converge on because I haven't done the actual maths to work this out. I'm just doing a Monte Carlo simulation here. But what I, would, what I would like to do is to make it possible to see the other distributions. And let's do that before we finish. So the midpoint method is working. I'm going to stop that and reset it. Uh, I need to make LL disappear when that tick box occurs and that tick box is called O. So is line LL also needs to depend on O. <clears throat> and let's just do the other methods as well. So the endpoint method, uh, let's make this line. If I make that a different color, let's make it more, this is lime apparently. And I'll say KK equals K. So I've got another one and I'll make the other one come on top. I think layer nine is always on top of everything. Uh, KK will have the same color, but not very opaque. And K will make the, uh, will make very opaque. I don't need the label. We don't need the label for these either. So now if we animate that, I'm going to trace the, uh, the KK one. Let's see what happens this time. Is that working? I think it is. So this is the effect you get when you choose two random endpoints and you join them with a chord and the pattern you build up here is lovely too, but it doesn't have that um, massive hole in the middle. Like it does seem that it is distributing not entirely uniformly, whatever that means. Maybe I'll let this speed up and you can see actually what happened over time. This one does seem to produce chords that go very near the center, um, but it does seem to dominate. The, like, there's more chords that are almost tangential. Um, so it's kind of wrapping the circle kind of nicely. I just really like the way this looks as well. Uh, so what would the radial point method do? Let's build that one and then we'll leave uh, all of them running just to see how they compare. So let's stop the animation here and reset and clear the traces. Turn that one off and they all disappear. Although I do, do, do need to make KK depend on that one. What's this one called? Uh, P. So let's make KK depend on P. Finally, let's make uh, this one, which is Q. And we'll get the other line, which I think was M. So M and M equal M. We'll create another copy of that. We'll bring the M to the front and we'll change it to be a nice color. Uh, layer nine. Color. What should we do this time? Let's do, let's do a red one. Bright red super opaque and the mm will make super not opaque but bright red uh, and i think that's enough and we'll trace that one turn its label off turn that label off as well i think that's it let's just animate this one so this is choosing a random point by the radial method uh, and letting that go and i'm kind of ignoring what the candles are doing here but the candles are still checking whether the cut lands between them and you see it every time I run this, it's producing different numbers, but they do seem to converge to, to different places. And this is a different distribution of chords again. So really what we've spent ages doing and faffing around with Jojo is making uh, a really nice thing in, in Jojo, which is not the best way to program loops, but it is a really nice way to organically program things which have nice visuals and you feel like you're getting your hands dirty on. And you can see this time the chords do feel like they're much more sort of densely uniformly distributed by some visual thing they don't seem to be clustering as tangents and there definitely is not a hole in the middle it is a, a beautiful structure this is a bit sort of super random knitting effect but is this a better way of choosing chords than the others uh, i don't think there is a good answer to that and that's what um grant and brady spent a long time discussing and you should go and read up on bertrand's paradox to get the bottom of this there are other ways to define chords and what i think i'll do at the end of this video now is i'll just leave four animations and um, three of which are the animations based on the methods I've just been showing you. And one other one, which I did by choosing a random chord by picking a random point in the circle and then a random angle for the cut, just like I kind of did with the square earlier. 
Uh, and as far as I can tell, it gives a different result again. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I'll leave you with some nice animations. And uh, I enjoy building Jojo stuff. I've spent a long time on this stuff. And uh, I'll do some more with Numberphile and Brady as well. But uh, if you want to see more, then I'll see you in the next live Jojo build on this channel. Thanks.